Okay, let's continue. So uh, now I just have a ton of research questions and let's go through them, see what, uh, they're not all perfect. So they, we can kind of start to analyze them and talk about what they're asking, what might not be working, what's working, and also maybe talk a little bit about what kind of methods would, would take place with such a research question. Okay, here's a, here's a mouthful. How can I apply the harmonic and melodic material deriving from the modes of limited transposition by Olivier Messiaen and combine them with contemporary functional jazz harmonic language in my own compositions for piano, trio, and improvise with them? Oh, God. That's weird. Where is it then? No, oh, but that's mine. One second here. What? Okay. How can I apply the harmonic and melodic material deriving from the modes of limited transposition by Olivier Messiaen and combine them with my contemporary functional jazz harmonic language and my own compositions for piano trio and improvise with them? What do you think about that? Yeah, I see you guys are like, that already tells me a lot. Yeah, it's too long, too many facets. One of the things she said before was that it should be concise, and I'm just not sure if this is... Concise. This reads more like a method than a question and it may be restrictive by too much detail. Okay, so a possible reformulation. How does my musical language develop or evolve by applying Messian's modes of limited transposition to harmonic and melodic materials within my compositions and improvisations? It's also still, it's a little bit better, but still really long, right? because we have developing language, applying these modes to harmonies and to melodies in both compositions and improvisations. In a way, it's like, it seems like six different researches. So maybe it could just be, how can I uh, apply Messian's modes of limited transpos transposition to my music? Boom. Then we can talk about what the modes are. And then you could say, well, I, I'm, a, I'm a jazz composer, or I'm going to start with my trio, and I'm going to write some pieces with these modes, or I'm going to start improvising with it. And then you get started. And then maybe you write a piece, and then you say, well, that was, that was an interesting first approach, but um, there's still so much more to explore with that. So I'm going to write some more pieces. And maybe in the end, you end up just researching how to apply the modes to your compositions and you don't get to the improvisations, right? So this, this is the thing that you keep it specific, uh, but also uh, vague in terms of like what all the methods are going to be and how far it's going to go. Because the question can help you, okay, we know it's, in this case, it's, Messian's modes, limited transposition, and my music. And then you can start talking about how that's going to work. Okay, here's another one. How can the sonoristic structures of selected works by Pinareski, Zinakis, and Stockhausen influence my own design of sound? What do you think about this one? Too vague? Yeah, the influence Yeah. I said it lacks vision and inspiration. So here's a different reformulation of that question. 
How can the sonoristic structures from the past inspire my 21st century vision for the design of sound? Right, so now you, okay, we're talking about sonoristic structures, whatever that is. And if we're talking about the past, then you can go back and look at these three composers, Penderecki, Zanakis, and Stockhausen. But it could be that you start working on Penderecki and looking at, you know, the famous piece, Threnody, and all the different techniques, and you say, wow, that's really great, and I can do more with them. And maybe in the end, you just start, you stick with Penderecki. Whereas the original question, you have to then go to Zanakis and Stockhausen, right? But it also reframes the question um, uh, less from the methods of checking out those three composers and a little bit towards a sort of vision of past approach and new approaches. Um, and then there's also this one, what can be learned from Penderecki's and Nakis and Stockhausen's sonoristic approaches to inspire my vision for new possibilities of sound design. So this in a way combines the two. It has three composers and it also has some vision in it. So um, but it's it's it has a completely different spin to it than how can their uh, structures influence my design of sound. Well you just listen to it once and you're already influenced in some way. So it's already also kind of vague. Okay. Uh, here's another one. How can I arrange and perform heavy metal songs for cello, applying and expanding my knowledge on the instrument and finding new techniques to match the sonorities typical of these musical languages while capitalizing all the possibilities of the instrument? <laughs> Yeah. You could just yeah. Really yeah. great. That's exactly right. This 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 version contains a question, a goal, a method, and another goal. You know, applying and expanding my knowledge is the goal. Uh, the, the method is finding techniques to match these sonorities and capitalizing the possibilities of the instrument, that's another goal. So, uh, possible reformulation. <coughs> Which new techniques, sonorities, and approaches can I develop to adapt heavy metal songs to cello? And how can they both expand my current knowledge and challenge me to create new repertoire for the instrument? So it's, it's a little bit better worded but it still has too many facets to it. Or indeed, how can transcribing and performing heavy metal on the cello lead to new playing possibilities? And then you can go through all those things under that question. Okay, let's look at some other ones. How can I expand my toolbox as a classical viola player and create an informed interpretation of Scottish tunes by exploring Scottish fiddle techniques and applying it to the modern viola. So here we have expanding toolbox. Okay, it's again, it's a goal. Uh, we have a classical viola player and they wanna play Scottish tunes uh, in a way, we have two researchers here. Number one is creating an informed interpretation of the Scottish tunes. That's the first research. And then the second research is uh, uh, applying Scottish fiddle techniques to modern viola. Okay, it could happen. This could be a nice research. You start out by studying what the Scottish folk music is. Then you, you learn to play a couple pieces really authentically. And then that, that gives you some ideas about techniques and the way to play. And then you take that and you apply it to your Hindemith Sonata for viola. And, and then you come up with a new way to play that piece. 
How can singing and playing Fado melodies expand my tools to develop a more lyrical and expressive way of playing the violin? This is kind of like yours. Yeah. Right? Singing and playing. So, uh, um, in a research like this, with this research question, the first thing you'd have to do is define what lyrical is and expressive. Right? Because if we're going to answer that question, we need to know what those are. So what does that mean, uh, a lyrical way of playing? I guess it's imitating a human voice. Okay. Maybe it should be vocal then. Is there a difference between vocal and lyrical? Does lyrical have to have lyrics, for example? No, that's, a, that's a, not connected. Okay, well, th we'd have to figure that out. <laughs> of lyrical. Quite interesting, actually. It's not really vo meaning vocal. Here it says having an artistically beautiful or. It, it's also vague still, but. Yeah. Having an artistically beautiful or expressive quality suggested as a song. A lyrical thing. A lyrical realm. Yeah. So, so, and then I Google further, and then there are lots of people that are doing a style on, like, defining lyrical. Right. So, so I think it does actually... It does seem to have a meaning. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I also feel like it's just a word that we like to use to express some way of playing. It happens a lot in musical reviews and... Right. It's just something we like to drop, I think, the word lyrical. Yeah. I don't know. Well... Just because Bang is lyrical, Chet Baker is lyrical, like... Right. Well, what does that mean? You'd have to, you'd have to say what that is. Yeah. And maybe it comes down to, you know, uh, legato playing and uh, using a certain type of articulation and tone color. I'm just... I'm yeah, guessing. Yeah. No so, stuck in patterns, not playing melodies while improvising. Let's say it's like that. Yeah. And if when you can reduce it to those parameters, legato, tone color, and articulation, then we can make a score and we can analyze. We could go through and take 10 recordings of musicians and with the music and we could document and analyze the way they do those parameters. And then on the basis of that, we come to some information about the way that works. And then you could then apply that to your piece. So in this case, maybe lyrical is something we could latch onto, maybe not. Maybe there's a better way to do it. You know, um, you know if, you, if you had said, expand my tools to develop uh, a better way of playing the viola, then it would be totally vague, because what is better, or, or, or a good way of playing, right? So, so, and we also use those words all the time. So there, there, this is what you'll realize when you're making your question, you, you really start to look at every word and what it means and how it functions, because, because how that is really has a huge influence on the way you carry out your research. How can I incorporate improvisation into my live performances, creating transitions between compositions while using extended techniques and scores for time management? Yeah, what does that mean? It's vague. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you in a second. This was a student I had and uh, <coughs> He is a classical pianist, and he also improvises. So he wanted to do a concept where he combines classical music and improvisation. And you know, then the options were like just improvise a piece, 
make transition between pieces, maybe improvise an introduction to a piece or something. And we decided from the beginning, okay, let's just start with transitions. So he would play a piece by Mozart, he would have an improvisation, and then he would play a piece by Chopin. And then uh, time management had to do with what was the length of the Mozart, what was the length of the Chopin. So if, if that was like eight minutes, six minutes, and that was, you know, uh, eight minutes, then he might do like a three minute improvisation. I don't know, something like that. So it had to do with proportions. Um, but what he ended up doing is then he said, okay, well, let's look at the energy level of the first piece and what's the energy level of the second piece. And then he, he did a series of different experiments of improvising, going from low energy to high energy, high energy to low energy, stay in the middle, things like that. So he kind of broke it into a, a sort of myth, methodological uh, uh, research. And then he developed different ways. So then he had developed a technique to, to, to work on the, the, the energy level between how he would go between pieces. Of course, there were a lot of other things he wanted to, at one point he decided to uh, look at how extended techniques on piano could be utilized. And so that became a whole thing about how can you prepare the piano, but still play the Mozart and then be able to do the extended techniques and get to the Chopin without hitting some you know, a bolt between the strings or something like that. So, uh, so he looked a little bit into those strategies. Um, and then what was interesting, um, he, you know, it started out with the transitions and then the ex technique, the extended techniques. And then by the two thirds of the research, I asked him, I said, yeah, but how do you, how do you grab those harmonies? Because he would just improvise and play these really amazing harmonies. He's like, oh, I just, I don't know, I just do it. And, uh, and that was a sort of aha moment. Because then we said, that's where the knowledge is. You have this amazing talent to be able to grab harmonies. And, uh, and they all sound good. And, and you, because you already know how to do it, you don't even think about working on it. It's just something you do. So then we, the last cycle of his research was devoted to harmonic theory and what are the different possibilities of harmonies and how does he do that? And, and then he talked about his practice and about the way it feels and the way he imagines things. And, and then that became a really uh, valuable part of the whole research about the way he creates harmonies. And then, you know, that, that was real new knowledge, which, um, uh, of course, the other ones also had new knowledge, but they were a little bit more uh, methodical. And then here's the Keith Jarrett one. How can I integrate Keith Jarrett's improvised language from his solo concerts into a fully improvised concert? So we had that. Uh, okay, here, here are some 3.0 uh, research topics. Questions. How can I make use of the fundamental tools of mixing in order to better communicate the raw energy of my music in recorded form? So this was a student who was really into raw energy um, and he had to say what that was and he had made a recording and he wanted to work on the tools of mixing in order to bring out that, that vision of raw energy. So it became a technical thing about what are, the, what, are the, what are the tools of mixing and how do they work? And then he made a bunch of different versions. This is a bachelor's research. And, uh, uh, and then you could kind of compare how that, what the results were. Here's another one. How do I embody my music? So it seems like a really simple research question, but this is a, okay, first of all, you have my music, so it's like his own songs, and then embody. So he was moving and making dance uh, combinations and movements. So 
it became looking at like David Byrne and uh, Pina Bausch and a couple other dancers and, and artists who are moving and then and then trying to understand the vocabulary of they mo their moves and then he created his own vocabulary of moves you know all these things and then he would use he could then look at the piece and weigh the piece what were the artistic intentions of the piece and then he could design a sequence of movements that would go with that artistic intention and that was all then explained Uh, here's another one. How can I use text in a performance about racism and white supremacy? So this is uh, this was a real personal research about uh, about these topics and uh, uh, and how how texts were used in different ways. How can I combine video and music as an interdisciplinary way of storytelling into a live performance? Okay, so here we have this video and music, okay, interdisciplinary uh, uh, combination, and then storytelling. So what she did is, first thing she did is she read some theory on stories. How do stories work? What are the different ways to tell stories? She also looked at how some theory about you know, visuals and music and how that works. And then she had her own creativity, which was using overhead projectors. And so she then took those theories and then developed a new uh, approach to, to a very specific series of songs, which she had written or performance. So then, and then she documented the way, the choices that she took to create this performance and the visuals, but it was very much, uh, related to theory and practices outside of her, right? Okay, how can I take the concept of taking my space? Uh, how can I embody that as a, as a, a moving maker? Yeah. So, uh, this was also a, a bachelor student with the concept of taking your space. So that was that was a sort of concept and it had a lot of different facets to it, you know, not only the space that your body takes, but how do you how do you project space? How do you how do you work in a space? And uh, so she did a lot of experiments uh, outdoors in the in the central square here in Utrecht. She also did these things. She was examining the the relationship between <coughs> space and volume. Really interesting experiment. So she was in a room like this with four people and then they would be uh, apart from each other, uh, singing really loudly. And then they would slowly walk towards each other. And are, are you texting or taking notes? Huh? Yeah. Oh, okay, great. So then they, they would walk towards each other and as they got closer to each other, they would reduce the volume and then and then go back, right? So then you get a different sense of space when you're loud and away from each other. And also a very different sense of space when you're close and soft. And then she did exactly the same thing, but inverted the volumes. So really soft at a distance and then really loud uh, close up. And of course the effect was incredibly different. Um, so she was doing those kinds of things and then these experiments and then creating some theories out of that and then incorporating, she incorporated all of that into a final performance, which was then documented. Here's another one. How can I uh, bring, uh, how can I integrate Jean-Michel Yara's 3D synthesizer sounds into my contemporary electronic music. So this is a, a, a pioneer synthesizer uh, maker. And uh, this student was really into his work. So he read everything about him. He also did a, a study into all these old analog synthesizers and how they worked. 
And one of his methods was to take a song of Yada, or Jada, however you say it, and reenact it. So he took a song of his and he recreated it, it like word for word, or sound for sound. So he tried to make all the different layers and the different synthesizer sounds and different effects. And by trying to reproduce the original so closely possible, he learned a lot about the way all these things work together. And then, uh, and then after doing that, he then made his own new pieces where he used all this stuff. So, uh, so you can see the way there's these uh, very uh, methodical, uh, organized uh, methods that are being carried out. And then there's the artistic components, which are usually less methodical, more intuitive. And there's a sort of, uh, 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 they're, they're combined in your research. And that makes for a really nice uh, uh, research dissemination and process. Okay, no worries. How can I improve control in my rhythm and bow technique through body percussion and body movement? This is like two questions and two methods. So it's a little, it's hard to, hard to organize it. it. This could be better if it was more hierarchical, <coughs> in my opinion. And maybe one or two less things. Um, how can I improvise on a choral melody in different forms and styles? using core aspects analyzed from organ literature and improvisations. Okay, so this is an organist, and, uh, uh, and you know, he had played lots of choral compositions in churches, you know, from like Buxtehuda and, and uh, Mendelssohn. And so you have these choral melodies, and then they make these compositions. So he, what he did is he, he created a method to take the melody and then improvise on that. So he looked at all kinds of different ways that they would use imitation and harmony and registration in, in, the, in these compositions from like Buxtehude and Mendelssohn. And then he developed methods to be able to improvise with those elements. In which way can a creative narrative be integrated into my performance of Calculo Secreto by Jose Manuel Lopez Lopez? So this is a percussion piece and uh, he's uh, looking at the idea of creative narratives. So, um, so he's done, first of what he did is he, he, it's a vibraphone piece. So he looked at where, how does the, the pedal and the sticks, what are the, the possible um, uh, variables that you have to work with? And then he, he got a bunch of pictures. So he like took a picture of a cat or something and then played the piece and with that image in mind. And then that made him change his articulation, his use of dynamics, some speed issues. And so, or gesturality, something like that. So then, and then he did it with different pictures. And so it was really looking at, okay, well, when I take a different picture, what is that, how does that make me change the way I play? And so he's trying to create some theory about that. And I think he's going to look at either like uh, storytelling or some other elements too. So there's a lot of creativity involved in this, in a lot of these researches. Um, okay, here's one. How can I incorporate Chinese traditional folk music styles with Western art songs of the 20th century? So this is a student from China. She's a classical singer, and um, there are some Western classical pieces that superficially use Chinese elements, like it'll have some pentatonic do 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 kind of thing, and maybe like some kind of you know really cheap stereotypical things. But she's from China. She understands Chinese traditional folk music the ornaments, she can play the Chinese zither. So she's creating a new interpretation of these songs by, by incorporating a lot of these 
uh, traditional elements. So in a way, she's taking, first of all, I mean, like these, the first set of songs that she worked with are like 100 years old. So, um, you know, our, our state of knowledge is way more evolved since then. And she's also has a, a, a real personal identity with where that information came from. So, so, so this is, this, when I say you should come out of some of your identity, these are the kinds of things that work really well because she, she already has a knowledge of traditional Chinese music, although that's a really broad topic, but she has some knowledge. And um, so she's applying that. She's learning more about the different forms of Chinese folk music. She's doing creative arrangements with this Chinese zither that she's doing. So there's a, there's a strong creative aspect to it. And, um, uh, and then she's taking these Western songs. Now, what's really interesting in a topic like this, or like sometimes you have a topic of working with fado or, or early music practice sometimes, the, when we, we get into this concept of authenticity, then people start to protect, right? So, you know, like a, a student of mine who did research into Fado, arranging Fado songs for clarinet, she played that for some traditional Fado musicians and they were really critical. They said, well, this is not Fado. And so then her research got her some criticism and then with this Chinese uh, topic, she sent it to a musicologist and the musicologist said, yeah, you cannot play those songs. That's, that's like colonialist uh, practice and it's really offensive. The way these, the original Griffith songs using, you know, this superficial use of Chinese elements. So it's, it's really, you know, these days we start to look at those are the gender issues, right? Did you guys ever, did anyone see the movie Tar? Nobody? Okay, well, there's a great scene where there's uh, uh, like a transgender student at Juilliard and he refuses to play Bach because Bach was a misogynist and only, you know, you know, and then she's like arguing with that. So we get to, you know, we, now we're at a time when all these issues are really, are like gender issues, like female composers. Those, those topics, a lot of people are looking into those because we want to be activists with our musical practice and um, uh, and have a little bit of power with this what we're doing and uh, but they're they're difficult they can uh, I mean go for them by all means but uh, they bring up all these questions so what happened was this one musicologist said that this Chinese you cannot play this music because it's a uh, it's colonialist right and then she sent it to another musicologist who said, no, it's really great what you're doing because you have your own vision on it based on your experience. And so, but it, it got into a kind of um, risky moment because, you know, it's not, it, uh, once you realize you're, you, we are living in a world of people and practices and opinions. It's, uh, it's not just us and our little research done in our own room, written for me and your mentor, right? <laughs> I think that's why it's essential to also wonder why am I doing this research because other musicologists can tell that you're practice you're doing a research which is colonial and then it's important to yourself that you know whether you are like that or not. Yeah. I guess. That's a really good point. So, so she could have said, I know this is a colonial piece, but I can bring a whole new interpretation to it which can yeah. which can uh, give it a whole new uh, identity. Yeah important to kind of stand your ground when you're being filled with others opinions yeah to always wonder is it what am i doing yeah absolutely and if any of you ever run into a situation like that you absolutely you come to me and you come to your mentor and we, we figure it out so but it's not at all uh it's not unheard of Okay, here was a nice research. Uh, how can i play emmy frenzel wegener's suite and menuetto for oboe and piano in an informed way by carrying out a thorough analysis of her pieces and archival research. So this was an oboist who was also interested in female composers. And in this case, she, she took a, a, a Dutch female composer from the mid 20th century, Amy Frenzel Wegener, who is relatively unknown. 
Um, and then she had these pieces. So the neat part of the research is that she went to libraries and archives and she discovered a bunch of letters from Nadia Boulanger and, uh, and all the, the conductor of the Concert Cabal she worked with. And, um, and she, she documented all that. And then she also had the pieces, right? Because it's artistic research. So she went through and she analyzed the pieces and, and came up with some ideas about the phrasing and the form and the meters and harmony. Um, but in the beginning, those, those two aspects were quite uh, unrelated. I mean, what are you gonna say? Say, okay, well, she went and studied with Nadie Boulanger in Paris for a year or, or had a lesson once or something. And then she wrote this piece 15 years later. What, what do you do with that, right? And I'm telling you, every piece of information in your data collection has to be related to your practice. So it was, it was a problem. What she ended up doing is, uh, um, was, for example, knowing that the piece was written for Rick Stotein, who was a, a Dutch oboist of the Concertgebouw Orchestra back in the 50s. And he had a certain way of playing and a certain way of making his oboe reeds. And there were students who either studied with him or studied with his students today. So there was a sort of pedagogical tradition about the way he played. And then she could, through interviews and recording analysis, she could understand what that was and then apply that to her interpretation of this piece. And then all the, so that was somehow loosely or a bit related to the, all the archival research. On the other hand, this research has been published on the research catalog, you could look it up. And, uh, and anyone who's interested in this composer will now find this information. So she's also done a really good service for knowledge about this composer. How can I demonstrate the relation between ballet and viola by analyzing my movements when dancing ballet and my viola playing? So this is a classical viola student who also was a really good ballet dancer. She had been doing both for many, many years. And she decided to focus her research on uh, uh, ballet music, orchestral music, where you have viola solos accompanying the dancer. So what she did is she would learn the choreography of the of the, the dance or part of it and then dance it and then observe and reflect upon that and then see how that would inform the way she plays these solos. And so then it was things about like dynamics and pacing and gesture and all that stuff. So so she could make that link based on her own um, experiences. While leading an unconducted ensemble as a solo flutist, how can I solve the technical issues, develop communication with the players, and create new artistic possibilities in performance? <coughs> okay. So, here we have one thing which is leading an unconducted ensemble as a solo flutist, right? So he's gonna play like a Mozart concerto without conductor. And then he, he broke it up into three different parts, which is solving the technical issues. You know, how do we start and stop together? Cueing. How do I communicate with the players? So like, how do you, you know, if you, if he has inspired at the moment to play slower or softer, how is he going to communicate that so they can do that kind of thing and create new artistic possibilities? So that one's a little open, what that means. Uh, we never finished this research because he switched schools, but, uh, but it was a good start to a research which was then had to have its, uh, it was kind of broken up into three different things. Okay. And last one for today is, how can I influence my interpretation of Isai's second violin sonata by incorporating a visual narrative and movement into my playing? So this was a violinist uh, who was also a really good drawer, amazing. So the first thing he did 
is uh, he wrote a story to go with this Isai Sonata uh, about a boy from a village and the samurai attack the village and then the village burns down. And there's, there's a whole story to it. And, um, and then he drew the pictures. So they're really amazing, beautiful pictures. And then he could show the pictures while he was playing. Uh, and, uh, and that those pictures in turn would influence the choices he would make about speed, about the, the articulation of the bow. And, and so then it, it became a sort of lens through which he could create a whole new interpretation to this piece, right? Um, and then he ended up also using some uh, movement where he moved around while he played the piece and also some uh, color. Okay, so what do you guys think about these questions? Is, that, is this helpful? I do wonder, some of them, like the first one here is a bit more obvious, but the others are a bit less so. Mm -hmm. um, how do they incorporate um, other sources into like a question like how do I demonstrate the relationship between ballet and viola? Because it's, well, like, like some of these are very much well, obviously practice-based research, but for the actual finished product, you do need to include other sources and references your own as well. Right. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, people's research. Yeah, yeah so well, well, one of the things you probably did was uh, analyze a bunch of recordings. So how, how did they do that? So she could then uh, see their practice. Uh, the theory-wise, um, I'm trying to remember what she did. Um, certainly there are books about relationship between movement and music. And uh, I, I don't remember exactly what she did, but there, there was a desk research part of it where she looked at articles and books and stuff. And there was, she also did a lot of research into um, the, the pieces, uh, um, the composers and the ballets that she was working on. So there was that kind of uh, musicological or historical research. And, uh, uh, and then, yeah, combined with her experiments. And so we're, we're gonna talk all about this about methods, but in general, you're gonna triangulate your research through a variety of different methods, which is basically gonna be desk research, you know, reading books and, and articles and researching websites, um, media research, where you're looking at recordings and videos of others and analyzing them, and then probably maybe interviews you might do, you might do reenactments, and then you'll have your experimentation where you'll be experimenting with things. So and it all, all of those different facets are going to be woven together to move the research forward. What other questions or uh, reflections are uh, about these questions? Okay. Uh, 